I bring you greetings once again in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord in whose name we have gathered together this evening to worship his holy name to fellowship with one another and to meditate from his holy word thank God for what we have been learning during the last two days of these Bible revival meetings this is the third in the series of meetings and these meetings are called as you all know Bible revival meetings and I turned your attention yesterday to the thrice repeated prayer of David the psalmist in book of Psalm uh, chapter 119 revive me Lord according to your word revive me Lord according to your word revive me Lord according to your word so any revival whether it is personal or corporate whether it is for the church or for the nation it must be according to the pattern and according to the standard of God's word only then it will fulfill the purpose for which God sends these um, waves and these showers of his blessing revival. On the first evening I spoke to you on deception because when the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ asked him what would be the signs of the end time or what would be the signs of his second coming when he began his answer even before he would list out the signs of his coming or the end time he warned them of the possible deception of even the very elect by great signs and wonders so we looked at various passages in the New Testament where we have got a reference direct reference to deception or deceit deceiving or and being deceived and yesterday we looked at one particular area of deception we began with uh, uh, second Corinthians 11th chapter will you please uh, open your Bibles to the um, same passage again where we would begin this evening talk please look into your Bibles for all the references I'm happy about this um, um, PowerPoint presentation or this overhead projection but it is also necessary that you look into your Bibles if you have got a copy of your Bible because it is that Bible which you'll be regularly using for your personal meditation and when you note down and when you just underline the, some of the words or the phrases or the clauses that I would stress in the course of this talk and that would easily remind you when you go for your review of these precious truths and these lessons. Second Corinthians 11th chapter and we have in verse 3 here was an anxiety and here was a worry of Apostle Paul about the congregations which he had planted I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived ye by his craftiness so your minds might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ he refers to the the first parents how they were deceived by Satan as far as uh, ye was concerned it was deception and as far as Adam was concerned it was disobedience disobedience always follows deception when deception and disobedience go together there is a total chaos and collapse in a person's life after that everything that he does and everything that he speaks and everything he goes on in the ministry of God with you find there is a conflict there is a kind of a imbalance that would set in deception and disobedience now when he referred to that uh, deception that he was uh, very much worried about that could possibly creep into the avenues of the congregations he gave an illustration in verse 4 if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted he makes three statements another Jesus different spirit and different gospel yesterday we like looked at what we call a different gospel or another Jesus now today we will move on to the other aspect in that same words he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached or a different gospel or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received my topic for this evening is a different spirit yesterday it was a different gospel and today it is a different spirit now this warning was not only served by Apostle Paul but very much by Apostle Peter as we will see in the course of this talk but I would like to begin with a very stern warning that was given by Apostle John in his first epistle fourth chapter and verse 1 beloved do not believe every spirit what does it mean anything that sounds spiritual 
Anything that appears supernatural, don't immediately believe it. But test the spirits whether they are of God. What is the reason? Because many false prophets have gone into the world. Now this was written 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, many false prophets had already gone out into the world. And today I think uh, they also have like population explosion. They also have a lot of explosion. Many, many false prophets have already gone into the world. So whenever you see, come across something that is spiritual or supernatural, don't immediately swallow it. Test whether it is of God. Now, the word many uh, catches my attention in this particular word. Many false prophets. Now, very interestingly, this I give you as a homework. You go through the New Testament and uh, you find uh, whatever that uh, false prophets or false ministers or false teachers or deceptive or deceiving spirits are referred to, you find that adjective many always comes. Many, many, many. I'll take you through some examples. Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel and look at the seventh word, seventh chapter. Here we have the Sermon on the Mount of the Lord Jesus Christ. And see how Jesus Christ warned us of these many deceptive spirits. Matthew 7, I will read to you verses 15 and 22. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And in verse 22 he says, Many will say to me in that day. Encircle that word, many. Many will say unto me in that day. They will say, Lord, Lord. But they are people who are totally... They worked and operated outside the domain of my revealed will. And come to the 24th chapter, you know, which chapter which we began with on the first day, when we are talking about deception, 24th chapter and the fifth words. Many will come, come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. Again, encircle the word, many. And then it says, they will deceive many. You know, these are not just accidental words. So when there is a, a consistent um, usage of certain strong words in the scriptures, that would make us understand that it should get all our attention, and it, it demands all our seriousness. Many will come in my name as false prophets, and many will be deceived. Again, many, many. Second Corinthians, second chapter. And look at the um, 17th words. Second Corinthians, second chapter. And verse 17, he says, We are not as so many peddling or adulterating the word of God. He is contrasting himself from the preachers who were adulterating or using the pulpit for their own personal profit. He says, many are doing that. We are not like many. And Philippians, third chapter. Now we referred to it earlier on another occasion. But you can look at it again. Philippians, third chapter. And 18th verse, he says, Many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Many are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And come with me to First John 2nd chapter. Now these are not accidental, because <clears throat> we are gathered here as believers of the verbal inspiration of the scriptures. Every word of God is pure. So here you say in First John 2nd chapter, and verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have already come. The Antichrist is one, but the agents and representatives of the Antichrist are many. Even in the first century, many Antichrists have already come. And we know that this is the last hour. Yes, what is the truth we are trying to establish here by this word many, many, that comes as an adjective whenever we talk about these uh, false prophets. The enemy usually comes like a flood. The enemy usually comes like a flood. We are all very familiar with that very interesting scripture text, Book of Isaiah. Now today, we'll have to go rather fast, and you are now um, used to my style of preaching and following. So I think uh, we won't have too many repetitions, because we have to cover so much, and within a short time, because of the time constraint, I would very much uh, appreciate your cooperation in quickly coming along. Book of Isaiah, chapter 59. I look at the 19th verse. The second portion of the 19th verse. When the enemy comes in like a flood. 
you know, the sweeping nature when he comes in like a flood. And at the close of the Sermon on the Mount of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he gave an illustration of what would happen. Come with me to Matthew's Gospel, 7th chapter, and look at verses 24 and 25. Therefore, this was the conclusion for the three-chapter Sermon of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we call the Sermon on the Mount. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. What happened? Rain descended, floods came, and winds blew and bet on that house. You know, rain, floods, and winds. Are you able to see the sweeping nature of these uh, false uh, spirits? And then when you come to Ephesians, uh, when Paul was writing to the Ephesian church about how they should be established and the, how they should be freed from the false doctrines, you know the word that he uses? Ephesians 4th chapter, and look at verse 14. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. This word wind is actually a tempest. You know, he's telling about a, a ship that's sailing in a sea and then the, that, the, it becomes very, it, there's a real tempest and the, the whole situation become, becomes very tumultuous. And then it is tossed, the, the vessel is tossed to and fro. You know, rain and floods and wind. Are you able to see all these? These are all, uh, when, when, when the Bible gives us such figurative language, it makes us understand the seriousness of what we are talking about. So false doctrines usually have got, take it from me, take it from the Bible, they always have a sweeping nature. They just sweep and just take people for a quick ride. Then you have a question. Brother, I thought um, wind is compared to the Holy Spirit and wind is compared to the rain. Uh, the Holy Spirit is also compared to rain. Yes, Jesus said there shall be showers of blessing. So how about that? And when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, he said that uh, everyone who is born of the Spirit is like a wind because you, know where the, you don't know where the wind comes from, you don't know where it goes, but you only hear the sound thereof. Uh, so is every man who is uh, born, and that's how he is born by the Spirit. So he was referring to yes. So what do we understand? The Holy Spirit also is compared to wind. The Holy Spirit also compared to rain. So what do we understand? The devil is a master counterfeit. Now that's the truth. The devil is a master counterfeit. Do you know that he has got nothing original? That he has got nothing original. If Jesus said it is written, he will say that it is written. You know, he always borrows. That is why we need to be extremely cautious and careful. When Satan begins to dash against the walls of the church with some false doctrines, with some funny things, he gives an impression that the Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God is moving. You know, sometimes... Uh, our uh, choruses are not too good. Some choruses are good, but many choruses are not very good. They are not very scriptural. But those days, you know, in the time of the Wesley, Wesleyan revival, you know, Charles Wesley and Fanny Crosby, or the Moody's uh, singing associate uh, Sankey, now they all spent a lot of time in the study of the scriptures, and they sat with the Bible teachers when they compose their songs or hymns and they would give their songs and hymns to Bible teachers to cross-check whether it is doctrinally correct. But these days we are not very much concerned about doctrine, we are concerned about the rhythm and the music and the tune. You know, there's a strong shift. So, so, so those days uh, they took doctrine and they just composed their hymns according to the biblical doctrine. But these days we listen to hymns and we listen to songs and choruses more often than we study the Bible. So we get our doctrine from our songs. <laughs> For example, I'll just give an illustration. We often sing that God is moving one more time. Now it looks very good. Now my question is, when was God sleeping? Now we say, the Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God was never sleeping. Even on the very first page of the Holy Bible we read, there was darkness on the face of the waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So God has always been working. The Spirit has been always been moving. You know, you know we need to really uh, look at these uh, uh, songs and the contents of the songs very carefully. If you turn with me to John's Gospel, 5th chapter, you know, very many times we say, Oh, God is moving again. God is moving again. God is, God is working again. As if He went on a very long vacation and sleep and stupor. 
Look at John's Gospel, 5th chapter and 17th verse. See what Jesus says. This is how we need to understand the biblical doctrine. Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now. Which means God has been always at work, right? You know, Jesus himself, he just makes this statement. My Father has been always working until now. And then he says, and I have been working. So the Father has been working, and the Son has been working, and when the Son left this earth, he sent another comforter who, to continue the work that Jesus began. So God is not suddenly at work, that he suddenly woke up, hey, what's happening? No, he has been always at work. We know when you use that word last days, we need to be very careful. When did the last days begin? Did the last days begin when 2000 AD was over? No. When did the last days begin? The last days began on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, when people asked what this means, Peter immediately quoted a very precious passage from Joel. What did he say? This is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet. In the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Now, strictly speaking, last days began even before the day of Pentecost. You know how I say that? Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Look at the first chapter, first word. We don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Thank God, we don't know. Um, just the unknown author of the book of Hebrews. First chapter and verse 1. God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken by his son. So the last days began even with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So where are we living now? Are we living in the last days? No. Where are we living? We are living in the last two minutes. <laughs> because 2000 years ago, if it was last days, we are living in the last minutes of the last hour, of the last day, of the last week, of the last month, of the last year, of the last days. So God has been work. It's a new dispensation which dawned with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and following Him, the Holy Spirit. Now, this different spirit that we are talking about can manifest itself with various ministers. It can manifest through false apostles, 2 Corinthians, 11th chapter. Now, in the book of Corinthians, we have got lots of lessons. Because that church went through more confusion than any other church. So, because of confusion, Apostle Paul came with the teaching of correction. Thank God for that book. A lot of uh, disputes were there, and he came up with biblical solutions. Second Corinthians 11, chapter 13, the words. Such are false apostles. So the different spirit can operate through false apostles. And look at Matthew 7th chapter, and the 15th words. Matthew 7, 15. Now we'll be turning to these references back and forth tonight. And uh, in course of time, you'll find that these passages will become very familiar to you, and they'll pop up with fresh meaning every time you open up. 7.15, beware of false prophets. So, we can have false apostles, number one. Number two, we can have false prophets. Then we also can have false evangelists. Galatians, first chapter, verses 6 to 8. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who have called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So those who preach the gospel are the evangelists. So those who preach the different gospel are false evangelists. Then there can be false pastors. John's gospel, 10th chapter, 12th words. You know how he can operate through various ministerial gifts, gifted people. John 10th chapter and 12th words. He says, he who is a hireling and not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and he flees. He is a false shepherd. So we talk about fivefold ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, all could be false. Then teachers also can be false. We can have false teachers also. Turn with me to Second Peter. Second chapter and first words. You know how we need to be extremely and extraordinarily careful living in the last two minutes. Second Peter, second chapter, verse 1. There were also false prophets among the people, 
just like there were false prophets among the people, there will be false teachers among you. So you have all the five ministries covered here. False apostles, false prophets, false evangelists, false pastors, and false teachers. Is that all? There can be false believers also. <laughs> we should not throw all the blame on the pulpit. How about the pew dollars? Galatians, second chapter. And look at the fourth verse. Galatians 2 and verse 4. This occurred because of false brothers. So that doesn't mean sisters are excluded. <laughs> now that's a common gen generic that is used there. So when the Bible says false brethren, the Bible also means false sistren. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not English, but anyway, we understand. <laughs> so false brothers, false sisters. So the false uh, sheep, the false people of God, that also can be there. So what I said, you know, not only by Jesus Christ, but also by the Holy Spirit, that is a very strong prediction. I use that word, strong prediction. We already referred to that verse. We'll look at that verse again. First Timothy, you know, I'm so happy that you, within these two days, several of you have grown by two, three inches. First Timothy, fourth chapter, you know, you are now quickly able to understand and relate and put things together because your mind is now getting exercised for proper discernment. First Timothy, fourth chapter, look at the first verse. Now the Spirit expressly says, underline the word expressly. Another translation says, the Spirit explicitly says, or openly says, He directly says, He emphatically says. Now all these translations could be there. Now you get those words from Amplified Bibles. In the latter times, latter time means the concluding part of the last days. Latter times. Originally we were talking about last days. Now the word is latter times, which means the last portion, the last segment of the last days, when the coming of the Lord is just going to usher in, the return of the Lord. And when the end of the age is going to just dawn over us. And you know what we read in the first verse of that uh, First Timothy 4th chapter? Some will depart from the faith. Depart. You know, I just referred to this word in the original. And I found that word departure is not a sudden leaving away or forsaking. It is a slow and steady departure. Which means it generally will go unnoticed. You know, the person who is uh, coming to the church every day and suddenly he doesn't come to the Sunday morning service someday and you go to for find him only in a pub, smoking and drinking. Now that's a sudden, open, transparent backsliding. Now that kind of backsliding can easily be healed. But do you know more people backslide inside the church than outside the church? Those who backslide inside the church, nobody will know that. The pastors will not know that, the committee members will not know that, but they would be backsliding. Take the story of that uh, prodigal son. You know, I, I don't like to call the younger fellow prodigal. I would like to call the elder fellow prodigal. Because the end of a story is more important than the beginning of a story. In the end of the story, the younger boy is inside the house, but the elder boy stands outside. So who is the prodigal? So the end of the story is important. No, that's, what it, that's how we interpret the Bible. So we have got too many elder brothers in the church. They are inside. All the time they are inside. They are with the father. But they are backsliding. And their backsliding goes unnoticed. So it's a steady and slow departure. It is not an intentional departure. They don't want to go against the truth or against the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. But unconsciously, they just keep on going. It is something like this. You know, you know the story of that frog. You just throw a frog into a, a bowl of uh, real hot water, it just jumps out. But you just keep that uh, uh, frog inside uh, cold water like this and keep on heating it up. It gets slightly warm. Oh, that's fine. A little more. Oh, that we can still put up with. It will never jump out. You can try it if you want. It will never jump out. It will die. Because it is slow and steady. It's killing. It's slow and steady. Now that's what could happen in the, in the area of doctrine. Unless we are consciously on the alert. Now, I want you to just... Um, uh, you don't need to take down. It will be too much for you to quickly take down. But I want you to know 
how serious the apostles were about these false doctrines creeping into the church of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 11th chapter 13th verse, they call these people as the deceitful workers. Deceitful workers. In Galatians 1st chapter and 7th verse, Paul calls these false teachers as troublemakers, troublemakers, trouble creators. And in the second chapter of Galatians, fourth words, he calls them false believers, false brothers. And in the same book of Galatians, third chapter, verse 1, he calls them witches. Because he says, you are bewitched. Only witches bewitch people. And in Philippians, third chapter, second word, he calls them dogs. In the same chapter, in the 18th words, he calls them enemies of the cross. In Colossians 2nd chapter verses 4 and 8, he calls them deceivers, cheats. And in Colossians 2nd chapter 18th words, he calls them frauds. I just picked these words from the Bible. You might wonder whether the such words are there. And in 1st Timothy 4th chapter 2nd words, he calls them liars. In the same epistle, 6th chapter, 4th verse, he calls them proud men. And the same chapter, 5th verse, he calls them corrupt men. Corrupt. 2nd Timothy, 2nd chapter, 16th verse, he calls them vain babblers. And 17th verse, he calls them cankers, cancerous cankers. And the same second chapter, 26th words, he calls them captives of the devil. And in the third chapter, 13th words, he calls them imposters and evil men. Titus, first chapter, 10th words, he calls them idle talkers. And the 11th words, he calls them subverters. And third chapter, ten towards, he calls them divisive men or heretics. Deceitful workers, troublemakers, false brethren, witches, dogs, the enemies of the cross, deceivers, cheats, frauds, liars, proud men, corrupt men, vain babblers, cankers, captives of the devil, imposters, idle talkers, subverters, divisive men, heretics. Were they trying to stage a campaign against God's servants uh, to try to tear down and destroy God's work? No. They just wanted God's people to know how dangerous a false teacher or a false prophet or a false pr uh, pastor or a false uh, prophet or a false apostle could be. Now I want to give you homework. You know, every day I'm giving you homework. Hope you note it down. There is another homework that I'm giving you. You go through the epistles of Peter and try to find out the names that he gives to these false uh, prophets and false teachers. Go through the first and the second epistle of Peter and then find out. You list them out and just keep it before your eyes. You know, normally when I study the Bible, I keep a Bible notebook with me. This was taught to me by my mentors when I came to the Lord in the year 1962 as a college student. So my professor who just led me to Christ, he just taught me this principle of always studying the Bible with a notebook by the side. And some of the verses which I like, I immediately take my pen and the same words, I write it on my notebook. Do you know, the same words which you have been reading for 5-10 years, when you take and write it down on your notebook, you understand it better? When you start writing it? And everything that I'm able to understand from the meditation of God's word, from that day one until this day, it is all there as different, different volumes of years. 63, 64, 65, 66. And I told my, partner, my daughter, that is the legacy and that is the treasure that I leave behind. And after Papa goes home, goes to his eternal call, you just take all this and use it and give it to preachers and let them use it. From day one until this day, from 1962, whatever I have studied, I have put it on notebooks. To take a pen and write, it's very difficult. You'll feel lazy to do it. 
But if you can overcome that laziness, it will be a tremendous asset for your biblical understanding. And what I am preaching on pulpits wherever I go, is not what I suddenly prepare, what I have been regularly studying. And I bring them together, because I know, and that's why I'm able to speak with a real grip and grasp of the subject, because I have meditated those subjects. I want you to do the same. The Lord, I'm sure, is going to call several of you into leadership capacity, maybe in small groups, but be faithful in small things. God will take you to be a ruler and responsible for greater things. I'm standing and speaking here tonight with a great burden and concern for these, uh, these people, you who are really godly and you are biblically and spiritually minded. You know, when Apostle Paul wrote his uh, letters to Timothy, you know, we all like uh, Timothy, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy. Technically, we call them as the pastoral epistles. Why do we call them pastoral epistles? Is it not for others? They are called pastoral epistles because, Apostle, because Timothy was a probationary. He was in the making of a servant of God. And Paul was mentoring him. When Paul was mentoring him, he wrote to him these letters. Thank God he wrote to him these letters. Now, I often used to think that uh, God had the two reasons why he often put Paul behind the prison bars. One reason to give him rest. Otherwise, uh, he would have uh, been burnt uh, before time. And another reason why God uh, pushed uh, Paul several times behind the bars was to give him time to write. You know, many preachers today don't write, so I tell them, Oh God, please imprison him. We have got so many preachers, especially in India, we have got so many preachers. I have listened to them, rich, rich messages. It has come, but they never took time to sit and write. They would say, no time. No time. So if God has given you the grace of understanding the scriptural truths, and if God gives you some direction and some burden to write, start writing. Not necessarily your book must be published immediately by Zandrawan or Baker or Bethany Publishers. Not necessary. You write down. That itself will give you a better understanding of that subject. So God put Paul many times into prison so that he would write from there. And here is a letter that he has written. Why did he write that? Look at 1 Timothy 3rd chapter. And then he says in verse 14, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. <laughs> I'm going to come and see you in person, but uh, before that I want to write to you. Because I don't want to waste your time. I don't want any days to be wasted in unprofitable activities. And he says, if I am delayed, you know, we can't just go on time. Those days, you would go by ship, and when the ship will go, where it will go, which wind will be favorable, nobody knows. So if I am delayed, I write, so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of Jesus Christ. So the Bible is the textbook for the life of the church. That's what I'm coming to. These are all the premises in which I'm going to develop my message this evening. The Bible. Now these days, many strange phenomena and experiences are reported all over the church. People suddenly fall on the floor. They call it slaying in the spirit. And in some services, they laugh uncontrollably for hours together. And in some meetings, people vomit. And in some meetings, people begin to roar. And in some meetings, they just fall and crawl underneath. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Still, so more, more, more things are happening. And believers are terribly confused. What is this? How to discern? whether it is from God or it is from Satan. Now before I go into the body of this message to answer this question, I want to make a statement. I am an ardent believer of the gifts of the Spirit. I come from an Anglican background, but I received the Holy Spirit along with a few college students in the year 1962. And the Lord baptized me with His power and His Spirit and I began to speak in tongues in 1962. From 1962 until this day, even before I went over here on the pulpit, I daily speak in tongues 
with God to edify myself. But I do it privately. I don't do it publicly. Because the Bible does not encourage public speaking in tongues. It's, it's something to be done between you and your God. And I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Several gifts of the Spirit operate in diverse manners, in different situations. And I teach people on the gifts of the Spirit. I encourage people on the gifts of the Spirit. And how to operate and how not to operate. So this has been my regular subject. I have no question on that. God's Holy Spirit is restoring the gifts of the Spirit to the church. But... I believe the most important gift that every Christian today should have is the gift of discernment. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12th chapter and look at the 10th verse. This is where we have the nine gifts of the Spirit listed out. It speaks about the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, etc., etc. And then in the 10th verse you see to another prophecy. It's a wonderful gift. It's a very coveted gift. Prophecy. And immediately after mentioning the word prophecy, it says discerning of spirits. There's a reason why the discernment of spirit is given immediately after mentioning that gift of prophecy. Prophecy and the discernment of the gift. Now you may have a question. Brother, what if... God does not give me the gift of discernment because it says to some he gives the word of wisdom, to some he gives the word of knowledge, to some he gives the gifts of healing, to some he gives the gift of working of miracles, to some he gives the miraculous faith and so on and so forth. Suppose God does not give me the gift of discernment, would I be cheated? Would I be deceived? No. Gift of discernment is what God gives to selected few. But the art of discernment, discernment is what every Christian should grow in. Turn with me to Hebrews 5th chapter. 1 Corinthians 12th chapter speaks about the gift of discernment. Whereas Hebrews 5th chapter speaks about the art of discernment. Look at the 14th verse. Solid food belongs to those who are of mature age. That is, those who by reason of practice have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Underline that word, to discern. It's an exercise. It's something in which you grow. It's something which you develop. It is something which you learn. Art of discernment. Every believer today, especially as we are in the latter times of the last days, must grow in the art of discernment. If God gives a gift of discernment, praise the Lord for it. Generally, God gives the gift of discernment to leaders and those who are in charge of groups or assemblies or those who are in the pulpit. But for every Christian, by reason of their senses exercised, God wants them to grow in the art of discernment. Now today, I am going to talk to you four means that God has given us for discerning whether anything is from God or not. They are the tools of discernment or the means of discernment. I want you to follow this message very carefully. And even in the course of this message, you will see several things becoming very clear over which it's how the whole thing is very confusing for you. And be with the spirit of prayer that God will help this evening meditation to remove scales off your eyes so that you will see things as you ought to see. Some of us have had our first touch from God. But still we don't see clearly. When Jesus touched that blind man, even though it was Jesus who touched him, the healing was not complete. Jesus asked him, how do you see? He said, I see men walking as trees. So Jesus touched him again. How do you see now? He said, now I see everything clearly. I think some of us need our third touch. Even second touch is not sufficient. So maybe God will give us another touch tonight to see things as we should see in God's perspective. Four means of discernment of spirits. Number one, discernment through the scriptures. Discernment through the scriptures. You know, a lot of strange things happen on the day of Pentecost. I would like you to quickly recollect what happened on the day of Pentecost. There are tongues of fire which came and rested upon the disciples. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 1 to 4. 
They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in tongues and it was all noised abroad. The whole thing was very strange. It was other than the usual. In the regular services, this was what was witnessed or happening. So people who were all devout people, they were, they were not debaucherers. The Bible says devout men from all over the world had gathered in Jerusalem on the day. Devout people, godly people, maybe worshippers of Jehovah. They were not pagan worshippers, worshippers of Jehovah. They had come to the festival in Jerusalem because it was, a, it was a festival of Pentecost, very important Jewish festival. So when they all gathered together, they found these disciples doing all sorts of things which were quite new to them. So they asked, what is this? What is this? Peter did not say, I don't know, I don't know. He didn't say that. When they asked, what is this? He said, this is that. This is that, what? This is what? Turn with me to the passage, Acts second chapter. You know, this is how we have to discern if some strange thing is happening in our corridors. Acts second chapter, I look at the twelfth verse. They were all amazed and they were perplexed, saying one to another, What is this? What could this mean? And Peter comes up with an answer in the 16th verse. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he gives a quotation. In other words, anything that happens in our church, we must be able to find out whether there is a clear scriptural authenticity and there is a clear scriptural warranty for it. Whether scriptures will substantiate it. You know one of the very famous phrases for the early disciples? What is written? What is written? What is written? In 2 Corinthians 4th chapter 13th words, you see what they say. 2 Corinthians 4th chapter 13th words. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written. Underline that word. According to what is written. We can talk about faith, but faith, whatever exercise of faith, it has to be according to what is written. And 1 Corinthians 1st chapter, and verse 31, God has become righteousness, sanctification, and all these blessings for us, but our response should be, as it is written, underline that phrase, as it is written. And Romans 12th chapter, we are relating to people. Church is a body of Christ where various members are relating to one another. How should we relate? 19th verse. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written. And in that word, it is written. 1 Corinthians 4th chapter, and look at the 6th verse. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us. What should you learn from us? Not to think beyond what is written. Underline that. Underline that. Even if your Bible tears up, don't worry. Underline it. We, we want you believers to learn from me and Apollos. Not to think beyond what is written. Be within the biblical boundaries. Not my words. Be well within the biblical boundaries. Don't cross the biblical boundaries. Don't think beyond what is written. Now I have a question. Come on Paul. Come on Peter. Come on Apollos. Why did you learn this truth that you should never go beyond what is written? You resurrect them and bring them up here and uh, ask them to queue up before us and ask them this question. They all will uniformly say, Where from did you learn this truth that you should not think or do or speak anything that which is beyond the return? They would say, Of course we learned it from Jesus. Learned it from Jesus? Yes. What does the Bible say? God has given the Holy Spirit without measure to Jesus Christ. We all know that. For all of us, the Holy Spirit is given with measure. That's all we can contain. But for Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit was given without measure. That is why the Bible says, 
God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows, above your contemporaries. So the anointing of Jesus has got no equal above anybody else. So God, Jesus Christ, so full and overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit upon his personality, never ever exceeded scriptural limits. How do I say that? I'll give a simple illustration. It's very striking. There he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Roman soldiers came to take hold of him. Peter, as usual, was very excited. He removed the sword from his sheath and he cut off the ear blade of the high priest sexton. And Peter said, put that sword back into the sheath. You know what he told him? Peter, don't you know if I pray now, my father will release battalions of angels to protect me? I can do that, but I will not do that. I can pray like that, but I will not pray like that. Why? If I pray like that, how will the scripture be fulfilled that these things should happen? Hallelujah! Pray anything is not a right doctrine. If Jesus had asked, the father would never deny anything to his son. He would never deny anything. But Jesus said, even my prayer habits will be within the bones of the scripture. Are you with me? If I pray like that, how would the scripture be fulfilled? That these things should happen. Friends, we are all standing on a holy ground when I talk this important truth to you. I want you to look at a very famous, very important passage in the Old Testament, which a casual reader sometimes would uh, fail to notice. It's book of Isaiah, 8th chapter. Look at the 20th verse. I don't know whether you are aware of the importance of this very, very uh, crucial passage. Verse 20. Here actually God was speaking against people talking to dead. You know, in the 19th verse he says, Why do you go to the mediums and wizards and whisper and mutter? Why do you seek the dead on behalf of the living? Don't we have a living God? And come to the 20th verse. He gives a solution to all that. To the law and to the testimony. Underline it. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. I'm going to teach you something very important here. What is the Bible? The Bible is the word of God. What is the word of God? It is a law and testimony. What is law? Law means teaching. What is testimony? Testimony means examples. So Bible is full of teaching and Bible is full of examples. Any important doctrine and truth can be established by taking the teaching and the testimony. If the testimony alone is there, it is not good enough. If the teaching alone is there, we need to check it is for our times. But if there is law and testimony, if there is teaching and examples that make the word of God, if we speak according to that word of God, there will be enough light for us. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible is. To the law and to the testimony. If they don't speak according to this word, there is no light in them. But do you know, beloved, most of the modern experiences and phenomena that are witnessed and uh, boldly and proudly telecast in our medium, they cannot pass this test. It's not in the Bible. You know immediately what they will say. Beloved, there are very few things which are written in the Bible. There are many things which are not written in the Bible. So maybe what's happening today is what is not written in the Bible. But I want to tell you something. What is written in the Bible is sufficient for us. You know why I say that? If you come with me to John's Gospel 21st chapter, this is what is normally quoted. When you say that, oh, but that's not in the Bible, okay, it may not be in the Bible, but there are many things which are not written. The Bible itself says, John himself says, come on, come to John's Gospel, 21st chapter and verse 25. There are also many other things that Jesus did, 
which they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. Amen. They quote this. But I want you to know, in the 20th chapter, that is in the previous chapter, verses 30 and 31, John said, Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So what? Look at the 31st verse. But. Please encircle the word. That's what I said yesterday. You should always hold that uh, old conservative translations where you have got the conjunctions. There are many things which Jesus did which are not recorded in the Bible. But, what is that but? There is a truth. These are written, or whatever is written here, is that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, He is the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Is that not enough? So whatever is necessary for our eternal life, it is written here. Do you believe it? So whatever is written here, is enough for our eternal life. This is how we should interpret the Bible. Yo, there are many things which Jesus would have done. So what? God in his sovereign wisdom, follow me carefully. God in his sovereign wisdom, he superintended the Bible writers and the Bible authors to choose and write what is absolutely necessary for us on this side of eternity to prepare us for everlasting life. It's good enough. It is there. Don't argue from silence. When the Bible is silent, you become silent also. Never ever argue from silence. If the Bible says it, we take it. If the Bible does not say anything about it, keep your mouth shut. What is revealed is for us. What is not revealed, what is not written is not for us. Unless we take this important principle, you know what we will do? We will be like people who are removing the ancient landmarks. Proverbs 22nd chapter and verse 28. Proverbs 22 and 28. I may use some strong words today, but they are all not without reason. 22, 28. Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. And I will give you another verse, and it's for you to find out the reference. If you remove the hedges, serpent will bite you. <laughs> you know that verse? You remove the hedges, serpent will bite you. Stay within the biblical boundaries. Now I come with a strong statement. We not only believe in the supremacy of the Bible, we also believe in the sufficiency of the Bible. Amen? Important words. We not only believe in the supremacy of the Bible, we also believe in the sufficiency of the Bible. The Bible is enough for me. Don't go after the so-called, oh beloved brother, that's the new thing which God is doing. Okay, keep it with you, I'm not interested. I don't want to go after novelty. The going after novelty was there in time immemorial in the Garden of Eden. She looked at that fruit. Good for food. Sensational for the body. Pleasant to the eyes. Spectacular to look at. It will make one wise new revelations. We all know a verse. I'll begin that verse, you'll complete it, but I'm going to ask you the context. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why is this verse normally quoted? In healing campaigns. Jesus healed that day, He will heal you today. He is the same unchanging Jesus we all will sing. Nothing wrong in quoting it in healing campaigns, but that is not the primary purpose of the text. If you open up Hebrews 13, 8, come on. 
This is why I told you the first day, you should always interpret the Bible contextually. Hebrews, 13th chapter, you know, your, your mind is now getting exercised to discern and to interpret the Bible. Hebrews 13, 8. Why is it written there? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. So what should you do? Don't be carried about with various and strange doctrines. It is good that the heart is established by grace and not with foods and that kind of stuff which have not profited those who have been occupied. In other words, don't be carried away with the novelties. Jesus Christ is the same. This is how you should study the Bible. That's what I told yesterday. One verse if you want to study. Three verses before, four verses before, and four verses after. You find the context. So here the writer of the Hebrews, the unknown writer of the Hebrews is telling, why do you just one day here and one day there, you know, swinging, uh, pendulum is on one side and next day you suddenly jump into another bandwagon. Why are you like this? Don't just go after just, you know, keep on tilting to one side and the other side. Be established because Jesus Christ is the same. Yesterday, today and forever. Are you not able to see the primary application of the text? It is always the secondary application, but this is the primary application of the text. Beware of novelties. Check everything. Like the brains. Yesterday I told you, turn with me to the book of Acts and 17 chapter. Even if Paul is a preacher, or even if Brother Stanley is a preacher, when you get back home, please check, because Stanley can be wrong. 17 chapter of Acts of the Apostles and 11th verse. Paul and Silas, they went to Berea, but the people in Berea, they were compared to the people in Thessalonica. They were more fair-minded, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they not only received the word with all readiness, but they also, and, they did some homework, and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether things were so, this is necessary. After you listen to any preacher or watch a TV program or read a magazine or read a book, close it, open your Bibles and see the ancient landmarks whether things are so. Then you'll be more fair-minded. Then comes a question. But brother, uh, that sister uh, is a very sincere person. She says she has gone through that experience. So what? Let her keep it with her. Why should you be interested? Shall I tell you something? Anything that is not recorded in the Bible, even though it may look very spiritual, you are not obliged to embrace it. God will not hold you accountable for it. You are obliged to embrace only what the Bible says. Not to think beyond what is written. Everybody say that. Not to think beyond what is written. So this is the first means that God has given us for discernment. The second means God has given us for discernment is the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit. First, Holy Scriptures, and secondly, Holy Spirit. Suppose you come across something that is happening, something strange, Something quite novel, which is not very usual. When that happens and you observe it, or you hear about it, generally, mark my word, generally, if it is not really from God, there will be some kind of disturbance in your inner man. I'm talking something very delicate. There will be a kind of disturbance in your inner man, which means, the Holy Spirit who is resident in you gets disturbed. At the first disturbance itself, keep yourself away. Don't keep on arguing with your conscience. If you keep on arguing with your conscience, you will blunt your conscience. Because Holy Spirit is not a lion, he is a gentle dove. He will not always strive with you. He will only give you a gentle whisper. That we should always understand. The Holy Spirit does not blow dynamites within our heart. 
That's why the Bible says, don't, don't grieve the Spirit. What does, it, what does it mean? You can very easily grieve Him, hurt Him. And if you keep on hurting Him, a point will come when He will be quenched. Hey, man, can He quench God the Holy Spirit? Yes, He's so gentle. He doesn't quit, quit you, but He gets quenched. If He quits you better, He doesn't. You throw Him to a corner and He sit quietly, he becomes inactive because you have quenched him. You have greed him again and again. Finally, he takes a passive attitude. So you go from deception to deception. You are quenching him. You put him off. Possibility. Do not quench the spirit. So the Holy Spirit only gives a whisper. He doesn't shout aloud always. So if there's a little bit of disturbance, that's an indication. Is it in the Bible? Yes. Turn with me to 1 John, 2nd chapter. 1 John, 2nd chapter, verse 27. The anointing which you have received from God abides in you. That's why I use the word abiding spirit or residential spirit. And you do not need that anyone should teach you. Anyone should tell you is right or wrong. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, just as it does not you, you will abide in Him. Now some people take these words and say, I don't want any Bible teachers, I don't want any pastor, I don't want any study Bible, God the Holy Spirit Himself will teach me. That is not what is the meaning of this text. The meaning of the text is given to us in verse 26 of the same chapter. 1 John 2, 2, 2 26. These things I have written to you, Concerning those who try to deceive you. Concerning those who are trying to deceive you. You know, some preacher comes or some program comes or some book comes or some magazine comes. About that, the Holy Spirit says, nobody needs to tell you whether it is right or wrong. My anointing is within you. There will be a disturbance within you. That anointing will tell you whether it is from me or not. Blessed be the name of the Lord for the resident Holy Spirit. That safety measure is already built in within us. We need to really thank God for it, isn't it? That is why the Holy Spirit does not make shunting trips between heaven and earth. When we are all right, Holy Spirit resides. When we are not all right, Holy Spirit goes back. Then we get in. No, it's never like that. Even David in the Old Testament, when he committed some of the horrible sin in his life, he did not say, Lord, give me back the Holy Spirit which you took away from me two years ago. That's not what he said. He said, Lord, do not take the Holy Spirit from me. He was scared. But in the New Testament, you know what Jesus said? When the Holy Spirit comes, He shall always abide with you. Me? No! I abode with you only for three and a half years. Now I am saying, Tata! But the Holy Spirit who is going to be with you, He shall abide with you forever. So it's for your good I am going. Because I came for three and a half years. He's going to be forever. Until He will take this Rebecca and hands him over to the heavenly Isaac as a bridegroom, the Holy Spirit will not leave you. We really thank God for the indwelling, residential ministry of the Holy Spirit. So Apostle John wrote, there is an anointing that is inside of you. Nobody needs to tell you, there will be a little bit of disturbance, but at the first and the slightest disturbance, you should become alert. You should not begin to be flirting with that experience. The Bible says, the Holy Spirit in us, the Spirit in us is earning to jealousy. You know, that's the language of uh, the spouses. You know, a husband and wife, let's say that they're here and then suddenly a husband goes and then he talks to a very beautiful young girl. Immediately do you think the wife will say, Oh, get the camera, my husband is now with a beautiful girl. No, it's going to be a beautiful picture. No, she won't do it. Her spirit will be straight. She won't even mind these uh, good, all delicious dishes which are around here. She looked there. It's a safety. She cannot see anybody, her husband just flirting with somebody else. The spirit in her will yearn to jealousy. It gets stirred up. Deep bubble moments. The same language the apostles are employing here. The spirit in us is earning to jealousy. 
He cannot tolerate us flirting us with experiences which are not biblical. Then immediately somebody says, Beloved, but if it is the work of the Holy Spirit and it is not in the Bible and uh, if I don't embrace that experience, won't I grieve the Holy Spirit? I want to tell you something. It is not something that is questionable if you don't accept that's going to grieve the Holy Spirit. But you embrace everything as the work of the Holy Spirit, that will grieve the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? That's why the Bible says, Beloved, believe not all spirits. Test whether they are of God. Because many false spirits and false antichrists have gone into the world. The biblical principle is very interesting. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5th chapter. You know, it's very conclusive. 1 Thessalonians 5th chapter. I'll read to you verses 19 to 22. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Encircle the word all. Test everything. Bring everything under the scriptural scrutiny. Subject it to the test. God is not going to be grieved by that. Only if you don't test it, God will be grieved. Because he wants you to test. Test all things. And hold fast that which is good and that which is biblical. Does it stop there? No. It goes one step further. Abstain from every appearance or form of evil. In other words, even if something is somewhat questionable, go away. Right? Even if it is somewhat questionable, distance yourself. That's not for you and that's not for me. Let us look at the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the second comforter and let us claim that promise for all of us for these days, for difficult days that we are living in. I want every one of you to just claim this promise for you whenever you remember that. John 16, 13 and 14. When He, the Spirit of Truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. What is the truth, all truth? It is a truth teaching given by the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we say that? The next word says, He will not speak on His own authority. It's a very important truth. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit does not speak of His own authority. Jesus Himself said, this is a truth, very difficult truth, but this is a truth given by the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit does not speak on His own authority. But whatever He hears, that He will speak. And He will tell you the things to come. And He says in verse 14, He will glorify Me, for He will take of what is Mine and declare it to you. In other words, the Holy Spirit will only take the doctrine of Christ and He will teach you the touch. Are you with Me? But these days there is a shift. Oh, this is the Spirit speaking. This is Spirit speaking. This is a new revelation from the Holy Spirit. But beloved, Holy Spirit does not speak of His own authority. He takes from the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and He will tell it. That's why Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will remind you. What is reminder? Already you were taught and you are going to be reminded. I know some of you are getting shaken to the core. Because there is a lot of theological confusion. When we talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, spurious things are happening. Brother, I don't fully understand when you say that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of His own authority. This is one text. Uh, can you worship uh, it uh, with any other text in the Bible? Yes. How many texts do you want? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes. When you get back home, read the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation. Seven churches. Each message will begin like this. He holds the sword in his hand. He who walks in the midst of the candlesticks. 
Each one is a message from the Lord Jesus Christ to the church. And the end of each message it will say, what the Spirit says to the churches, he who has here, let him hear. What does it mean? The message of Christ was carried and conveyed by the Holy Spirit. Amen? In all the seven letters, the address will be the person who gives the message will be the Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of it it will say, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That means he takes of what is Christ and he gives it to us. Seven uh, examples are good enough? And because we have the promise that he will lead us into all truth. We can also join David the psalmist in this prayer. Turn with me to Psalm 143. Psalm 143. And look at verse 10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of righteousness. May I request all of you to read this prayer aloud together. One, two. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of righteousness. First, discernment through the Holy Scriptures. Secondly, discernment through the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, discernment with the help of saints and shepherds, leaders. Discernment with the help of saints and shepherds, that is, leaders in the church, elders. No Christian is complete in himself. Follow me carefully. No Christian is complete in himself. He needs others. No church is complete in itself. It needs other churches. How do you explain that? When I become sick, let's say there is an abscess here in my smallest of fingers. The whole body gets into a fever. There's a fighting mechanism. When there is a small problem in one member, the whole body tries to fight against the germs. Now that's the protection that God has given in the body of Christ. That is why it is not I and my God, it is always we and our God. You are in a society which is known for over-independence. Liberty is taken for over-independence in this country. Don't imbibe that spirit. God's plan for His church and believers is not independence, but it is interdependence. The disciples asked the Lord Jesus Christ to teach them pray. How did He say? My Father who is in heaven? No, our Father. Give me my daily bread? No, give us our daily bread. Forgive my sin and kill my neighbor? No. Forgive our sins. There is no first person singular in the Lord's prayer. Did you notice that? It is all first person plural. How come? That's the body life. We need each other. Because we need each other, we should not needle each other. I need my brothers and sisters to stay safe and stabilized in the true doctrine of Jesus Christ. Why has God given us ministers? Turn with me to Ephesians 4th chapter. This is where we began, you know, the fivefold ministry in the church. What for? Not for labels, but for function. What is that function? Look at the 11th verse. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For what? For the equipping of the saints. And the 14th verse that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. The ministry of an apostle is to protect the flock. The ministry of a prophet is to protect the flock. The ministry of an evangelist is to protect the flock. The ministry of the pastor teacher is to protect the flock. Not only in the present church context, but also we should learn from church history. 
I don't know how many of you have you ever read through church history at least in a, in a in a concise form. Please read through the church history. You know, you've got so many book stalls here. Try to go to a book stall and you don't need to take big volumes of uh, church history. Take one book which just contains it all from the first generation, that is the first century, from the birth of the church until now. Just see how the church has been growing and how many storms the church has faced and how many times the church went out of the way and how always God meant a remnant of people and how God always had some people who at some corner they would be crying aloud unto God with tears and sackcloth and fasting and how God could restore as to where we should be you know reading church history is very helpful we should learn from history but unfortunately the only thing that we learn from history is that we don't learn from history let's learn from history what God did and how things have happened you in this country you have no excuse please do go to bookstalls at least once in six, six months especially Christian bookstores don't be satisfied with what you have on the computer go to Christian bookstores and buy some good books and study them recently I came across a book that's now out of print yesterday I went to the Bethany publishing house here and to find that book is out of print you know the, what is the name of that book Sodom had no Bible that's the title of that book you know what that author writes in that Sodom had no Bible Sodom had no Bible schools Sodom had no Bible seminaries yet God judged Sodom America has got Bibles America has got a lot of Bible schools America has got lots of Bible seminaries if God does not judge America he has to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah And the title of the book is Sodom had no Bible this I'm not saying to threaten you I'm simply quoting someone and I just want you to get you to the Bible stores and get some book, good books especially church history and read them you know what we see in the church history during times of revival both, both good things and bad things will come up you know when there is a big shower not only good grains weeds also will spring up isn't it So when we consult these old revivalists of uh, D.L. Moody's time or Finney's time or Jonathan Edwards time or John Wesley's time, you know what we find? There is always a mixture of truth and counterfeit in times of revival. That's what makes the job very difficult. That's what makes the job very difficult. It's, it's an adulteration. It is not a total lie, it is a half-truth. But half-truth is more dangerous than total lie. So that is why, if I have some disturbance, I must go to my pastor. I must go to the other fellow elders. I must go to people in my congregation who have a good knowledge of biblical interpretation and sit with them and consider. Because they are given to the body of Christ for my protection. Because sometimes even the workers and the ministers of Satan can transform themselves into the ministers of light. Turn with me to that question in 2 Corinthians 11 chapter. This is a very dangerous thing. You know, only when we really get equipped we can just face all these dangers. We don't need to run away from dangers, we have to face them. 2 Corinthians 11 chapter, reading from the 13th verse onwards. Such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. <laughs> Satan does not come like the Anida figure. Black coat and then two horns and then long tail and sharp nails. No. That way if he comes with a black cassock, all of us can escape. But he comes as an angel of light. Not only he comes as an angel of light, he says in verse 15, it is no great thing that if his own ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. It will appear as if it is truth, but it is not truth. It is lie with a little bit of a sugar coating. How do I understand that? I need the help of my brother and sister. What I don't understand, my brother will be able to tell me. Two are better than one. That's a great reward for their labor. 
Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name. He did not say, where two or three are gathered to pray in my name, no. Just gathering together is enough. If just two believers gather together, one, two, he is at the center. You don't need to ask God, Jesus, come down. No, you don't need to ask him. He said, I am already here. Where two or three are gathered, I am. He doesn't say, I come. I am already there. What a blessing. That's a blessing of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the bride of Christ. Each member is precious. Even that member you think is not really important. Even that member is very important, very precious. There is no appendix in the body of Christ. We are all equally important, big or small. And we can help one another. Fourthly and finally, how do we discern? What is the means that God has given us? Discernment through common sense. Discernment through common sense. Somebody said like this, if common sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense. How is that? <laughs> Isn't it? You know, God has said, be renewed in your mind. He never said, get your mind removed. And what did we read in Hebrews, that chapter? Have your minds exercised. You understand? Minds exercised. We should not set aside our mind. We should not dislodge our mind from a, we should, our, our mind should think. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 1st chapter 7th words, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but He has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. When we talk about sound doctrine, we are coming to the sound mind. God has given us a sound mind. You know, sometimes you know what we think, brother, you know, spiritual things we should not try to rationalize. You know, getting into a mode of uh, neutrality and passivity is not spirituality, it is outright stupidity. You should think. Francis Schaeffer, during his time, somebody asked him, what do you think is the greatest worry and problem of Christians of today? He said, Christians have stopped to think. Let that not be told of us. God wants us to think. God wants our minds to be exercised. You know, some time ago I was watching, now, don't anybody should not get hurt, but I'm just giving only an illustration. I was watching a video that was uh, uh, maybe about 10 years ago or 12 years ago. I was watching a video that came from the West. In that video, it was a prayer meeting. It was, uh, you know, they call it a deliverance meeting and, so on and all that. Several people started vomiting. And they were bringing buckets to collect this vomit. As I was watching, I had a question. What does not come in vomiting? Does it go by your diarrhea? If vomiting can happen in the presence of God in a church, diarrhea also can happen. Strictly speaking, diarrhea is better. Because the Bible says, that which gets into the body or into the mouth does not defile. That only, only that which comes out. Because anything that you eat, it just goes off. So what will happen? What is the guarantee? If in that particular meeting, after one year, they get into still a deeper truth, instead of bringing buckets for collecting vomits, they may have to bring baskets to collect solid motion. And then at the end of the meeting, you will be left with 12 baskets full. It looks very obnoxious, isn't it? That's what I say, common sense. Common sense. People were asking a question to Paul. Can we keep long hair? Should we just cover our head or should we not cover? You know, these, uh, these are very normal questions. How long is too long? How short is too short? How tight is too tight? How open is too open? You know, such questions are very common. I mean, those, those, those questions were there in the time of uh, uh, the Corinthian, in the time of Paul. You know, Paul kept on talking to them. You know, finally, what he said? Does not nature teach you? Did he say that? Did he say that? Does not nature teach you? That's what I said. 
we should not just switch off our minds. That is a common sense that God has given us. Suddenly somebody says, a person in the prayer, he just gets up and he begins to bark or he begins to roar. And they say, Lion of Judah is roaring. The next day when he barks, I will have a question. Now what is barking? Is it the dog of Samaria? Now people go zing, crawling, hissing, finally it will be biting, beware. So we'll have to put some name boards in our churches, beware of dogs, beware of cobras. Does not nature teach you? A book came from the American press with the title, Animal Sounds of the Holy Spirit. And it became a bestseller. Distill idiotism. Animal sounds of the Holy Spirit. God has created man in his image. If you want to have some animal experience, you must become proud like Nebuchadnezzar. Tomorrow itself God will throw you out. And you can graze. That's a punishment. That's a judgment. That's not a blessing. Many more things, the worst is yet to happen. Because Satan will keep on changing his tactics. If he's not able to fail you by one attack, he will then intensify that attack or change his tactics. That's what has happened. Again, it's called wave after wave. You understand? Wave. It's like a wave. It comes in quick succession. Big wave it comes, you duck in, it goes up only to find another wave rises up. Because he wants to finish the church of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Stand. Ask for the old paths. Walk in them. You shall find rest for your souls. Thank God who has given us this means of discernment. The Holy Bible the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, and a sanctified common sense. Shall we stand up in the presence of God? Eyes closed and heads bow down. For want of time we have to close here. But nevertheless, the main thing that had to be said is said. I remind you of the words of Jesus who said, See, I have told these things to you beforehand. The enemy will come in like a flood. And the standard that the Spirit of the Lord will raise against him is the Holy Scriptures. That's the standard. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But the word of God shall never ever pass away. Everyone who listens to the words of mine and he obeys them is like a man who has built his house digging deep and founding on solid rock. Let rains come. Let the winds blow. Let floods dash. It will not collapse. It will not fall. Because it is founded on the solid rock of God's word. Everybody take your Bibles in your right hand and lift it up. Take your Bibles in your right hand and lift it up. And join me if you know that beautiful Sunday school chorus, the B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Everybody together. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Once more, everybody aloud. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have magnified your word above all your name. Thank you for giving us this great treasure of your holy scriptures. Thank you, Lord, that we have the Bible in our own mother tongue. We think of the hundreds of languages into which even a single line of the scripture is not yet to be translated. To whom much is given, of whom much shall be required. Forgive us, Lord, our sinful neglect of uh, unhurried meditation of your word. We pray, O oh God, that all that we have learned during these three days would just serve as a preparation and a starter and an appetizer for us to go deep digging into your Holy Bible and make it our lifetime joyful, delightsome occupation. Because your word says, Blessed is the man whose meditation is in the word of the Lord day and night, and what he does shall prosper. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.